Hello and welcome to Adapter Parish, episode 36, P.L. Travers, Mary Poppins. We don't have any big bits of business to discuss here at the beginning, but we would like to remind everyone that you can hear Ariel and myself discuss the many adaptations of Sherlock Holmes with the folks over at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere in episode 160 of their show, available right now in your podcast player of choice. We had a ton of fun doing it. As always, before we jump into this episode, let's talk about our next episode. In two weeks, we'll leave jolly old England for a more rustic setting and a less fastidious set of characters. We read Charles Portis's 1968 novel True Grit and watched both the 1969 movie adaptation starring John Wayne and the 2010 movie from the Coen brothers starring Haley Steinfeld and Jeff Bridges. We hope you join us in two weeks as we hit the old dusty trail with Rooster Cogburn. I'm suddenly super aware of how much that makes it sound like I don't go outside much. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections that you'd like to hear on the show, remember to email adapterparishcast at gmail.com or tweet at us using the AdaptCast hashtag. You can find all of the show notes from this and other episodes at adapterparishcast.com. And with that, on with the show. Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers. Welcome to Adapt to Perish, a podcast about adaptation. My name is Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. It's a jolly holiday. It, yes. Today. I like. I was so interested to know, like, which song were you going to pick for the intro? I just picked the one that you happened to be singing when we started recording. That song has been stuck in my fucking head for weeks now. I'm very sorry. I can't, like, I can't, every song in this, I, like, <laughs> we're going to talk about whether this is good like Mary Poppins is good yeah but I feel like I want to separate in terms of the songs whether they're good songs versus whether they're earworms yeah because they can be both yeah but they're 100 percent earworms well the nice thing about it is that there's more than one earworm so unlike like some I don't know I would say like Frozen only has one song that gets stuck in your head uh what what do you mean are you what? kidding me what why do you want to build a snowman no that doesn't get stuck in my head that's been stuck in my head for four years now. <laughs> okay well anyway mary poppins has a song to get stuck in your head for every occasion like the other day i took the dog out and i was singing let's go fly a kite to him <laughs> <laughs> and, and some days when the clouds are rolling in and you're feeling pensive, you'll just sing Chim Chim Cherie to yourself. Yeah, or Feed the Birds. Yeah. That's a good slow-paced one. Sister Suffragette, if I'm feeling kind of spunky. I had no idea that that was like your favorite song ever. Sister Suffragette is my favorite Disney song. In, it is my favorite song in any Disney movie. How about we backtrack for a second? Great. And let's talk about all the stuff we're going to talk about today. because. Going to talk about Mary Poppins. This is our big Mary Poppins episode. Woo. So we are going to talk about the book, Mary Poppins. Yes, I have it here. Which we read. Yes. We are going to talk about the movie, Mary Poppins. I have that here. We also watched Saving Mr. Banks. We did. In preparation for this for episode. Co- for context. Yeah. Just, for context. We, and we completely understand that it is also like basically Disney propaganda. Yeah. I mean, that was your opinion. I, I actually disagree, but we can come to that. We'll get to it. But I thought it would be nice to start this episode out with a little quick discussion about Mary Poppins Returns. Yeah. Which we just saw. We just saw it. I mean, the thing for me about seeing Mary Poppins Returns is that I feel like... So I have seen the movie Mary Poppins more than you have, I think. Yeah. So it was like a part of my childhood that I feel like it was not a heart of yours. And I also had the book that I'd read a bunch of times. So I'm very familiar with the plot and structure of the movie Mary Poppins. And I don't think you had this experience being less familiar with the original Mary Poppins because we we went to see Mary Poppins Returns in the theater before we rewatched the 1964 film Mary Poppins. But for me, it was like one of those dreams where like you're at a place or you're talking to a person or you're seeing a movie and it's something that you know, it's, it's someone that you know in real life, but it's not that person, but somehow you know that it is because it had a place for every character and every song from the original movie, Mary Poppins, but they were different songs being sung by different people, but the same. So like the last song in the movie is not let's go fly a kite. It's about balloons, 
but it's the same thing. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, 100%. So my experience was this is enjoyable, but it's like a weird dream of seeing Mary Poppins. But it's not like you've watched them like exhume a corpse. No, it's like Mary Poppins if Mary Poppins were like a fever dream. Gotcha. Yeah. I enjoyed the shit out of it. Yeah, by the why way. don't you talk about Mary Poppins Returns? I loved it. Um, so here's the here's the TLDR on my opinion of Mary Poppins. Um, we'll we'll talk about it more in a little bit. I never read the book when I was growing up. I saw the movie when I was a kid because you can't not see the movie when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. But I never really liked it that much. Mm -hmm. Like I enjoyed parts of it. I like the part with the cartoons. Um, Dick Van Dyke's great, but it was it wasn't something that was important to me in my childhood. I will say when we rewatched it, I enjoyed it much more now than I did when I was a kid. Yes. So I don't want anyone to think, oh, this jerk doesn't like Mary Poppins. How can anyone not like Mary Poppins? I do like Mary Poppins. Great. But I'm glad we've established that. It didn't... I, I've been like nervous to do this episode because this is one of those ones where I think people love it enough that if I don't also love it, I'm afraid I'm going to turn people off. I mean, fair. So going into Mary Poppins Returns, I didn't love Mary Poppins and I came out of it... I. I think Mary Poppins Returns is a better movie than Mary Poppins, right? No, I disagree. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying like, right, like that's something that people are going to disagree with. Yeah, no, I disagree. Yeah, I just, for me as a viewer, it, for what I like, it was better. Yeah. I liked the central plot of it more. Uh -huh. So like in the in the original one, there's nothing really tying the entire plot together. No, it's very episodic, just like the book. Right. And then in the end, there's... Like the big thing that happens when their dad gets fired and then he's going you know, gonna to lose his gets, job yeah, and then he gets, he gets his redeemed, job back yeah. and everything. Where in the new one, there's like a threat the entire time. There's a, there's a through line and there's actually a villain. Like there's no villain in Mary Poppins. No. Like not at all. Which is actually why I like it. Because I like movies that don't stress me out by ha having an evil character trying to like foil the plans of the people that we like. But it was like a low level threat. Yeah. Like you still knew everything was going to be okay. Sure. I just enjoyed it more. It kept my attention more in terms of the songs. Like Mark Shaman's great. Yeah. And his songs were great. Yeah. And if you need a couple of people to do some singing and some dancing. Yeah. You've got Emily Blunt and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Friend, friend of the pod. Yes. Don't do... <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret if we speak it it will come into being sure sure um they're great they're great it's great and a delightful movie and i loved everyone in it and it made me cry at the beginning like when michael has the song about his wife yeah like i wasn't expecting to feel feelings that hard in this movie well you didn't expect there would be like adult bereavement in this movie that's like, we didn't know that going into it and i'm here for that yeah totally I'm, I'm into adult bereavement i find it compelling <laughs> great I find it compelling and interesting. And all the kids were great. And Emily Blunt was fantastic. She's very good. And like, it's no secret that Dick Van Dyke shows up. Yeah. And he's a, like, that was the second time he's I cried. goddamn adorable. He's a wonderful treasure of a person. He apparently, so he's in his 90s. He dances every day. So he says. He says it keeps him spry. I said so he says like I don't believe him. I have no reason to doubt Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. He dances every he day. He dances every day to keep himself spry and apparently he smells very good according to one of our friends. For a second I thought you meant like a quote unquote friend of the no, pod. No, no. Our actual friend no, that we, we were talking to the other day that said he had it on good authority that Dick Van Dyke smells very good. Well, not a good authority. He met Dick Van Dyke met and Dick said Van he Dyke. smells good. Yeah. So we just thought we'd lead in with Mary Poppins Returns because it is out in theaters now and we did just see it technically... Well, I guess technically it is an adaptation of the subsequent Mary Poppins books, but we did not do enough. We did not read any of those books. Just I'm just going to put that out there. So if you're expecting us to say, oh, yes, they took this plot element from Mary Poppins in the park or Mary Poppins opens the door or Mary Poppins in the kitchen. We did not read any of those books, so we don't know. We're given to understand that they took some elements from the subsequent Mary Poppins books. Like, if we were going to go into it assuming that Mary Poppins Returns was an adaptation of any of the books, it would be kind of ignoring the fact that it it is clearly a sequel to the movie Mary Poppins. Yes, it definitely is. And everyone involved is involved because of the movie yeah. and not because of the books. Yeah, I don't want to spoil I actually don't want to spoil it because... I don't think it's like past by the time this comes out I don't think it'll be past the statute of limitations for not spoiling things mm -hmm. um but I will say like basically the children from the original Mary Poppins are now grown up and the adults that that is what's happening in this uh in this movie I think everyone knows that too I didn't know it going into it. Oh. I had no idea. Really? I hadn't read or heard anything about it. I wanted to keep my brain clean. Well, that's that's nice. Yeah. Did your clean brain enjoy it? 
Yeah, it was good. It was okay. I didn't like it as much as the original movie. We went home and watched the original movie like the next day and I was like, no, I like this better. Yeah, the entire time we were watching the original, I was just thinking, yeah, these songs are nice. I like the new ones more. There it is. Okay, so I have here my copy of Mary Poppins. Uh, This is a paperback uh, Dell Yearling book. Uh, This book is from 1981, this paperback. Uh, But the original book was published in 1934. Uh, by P.L. Travers Mm -hmm. and um, this book is interesting because it has a revised version of a chapter called Bad Tuesday which we'll get to in uh, in a minute Um, Jeremy's pointing at his at his iPad meaning that he has notes on this Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm gonna try to do Mary Poppins in one sentence the Banks family living in London with their four children requires a nanny comma (laughs) (laughs) And Mary Poppins, a nanny, flies in on the wind and becomes nanny to the children and they have a series of episodic adventures. The end. Do you know what surprised me? What? She doesn't fly until the end. No. Like she doesn't fly in. She flies away. No, she just shows up on the doorstep. Yeah. Yeah. This was weird. Yeah. This was super weird for me. Yeah. What was your experience? Well, so I had no experience with this book up until now. Yeah. Like until Saving Mr. Banks came out a few years ago, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. Yeah. I wasn't super aware of Mary Poppins as an adaptation. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about P.L. Travers. I didn't know about the original book series. It was not a series of books that I read. Yeah. So that, this being the first time, it just kind of surprised me how much it's the movie. Yeah. Like, it is the movie. Yeah. I expected something radically different. Well, especially given, again, having seen Saving Mr. Banks and how much of a fight the character P.L. Travers puts up about the adaptation, you would expect that they did something drastically different. Mm-hmm. But they, they, like, I would say that the tone of the book Mary Poppins is certainly a little darker and a little more grotesque than the movie. The scene where the children eat fingers that turn into candy and the scene where they go to the zoo and they see the people in the zoo exhibits and the animals like making fun of them. That's super dark. Yeah, it is. Um, neither of those things are in the movie. But the general sense of there's this sort of magical woman that comes in and turns everyone's lives upside down and takes the children on kind of magical adventures and opens up everybody's minds to what the world could be is the same. Opens everybody's minds up, but then also denies that anything was happening. Yeah, there's a lot more gaslighting in the book than in the movie because pretty much every adventure that they have ends with the children saying to Mary Poppins wow Mary Poppins that sure was fun when we went up in the air and flew around right and every single chapter ends with her going I don't know what I don't know what you children are talking about and that that does happen in the movie but not like over and over and over again can we talk about the gaslighting now yeah go for it I want to I want to go into this for a second okay so you read this book when you were a kid yeah and you love Mary Poppins sure How do you feel about the gaslighting? I mean, I don't feel great about it. It makes me think of Sesame Street. I'm very excited that you brought this up because I wanted to bring this up. He's like pointing at me and and like doing the go on symbol. Um, So a lot of everybody knows this. But when when Snuffleupagus was introduced on Sesame Street, he was Big Bird's like imaginary friend. And anytime Big Bird told any of the adults about him, he would disappear and the adults didn't believe that he was real. And then... And they were super dismissive. And they were like, oh, Big Bird, like it's fine to have an imaginary friend, but like don't expect us to believe that, you know, he actually exists. And Big Bird would get like upset. This was like before my time on Sesame Street. This was probably like late 70s, I think, that this happened. Um, It was literally like season one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And then at a certain point, they realized that... This was not sending a good message to children. They wanted children to understand that adults should believe them when they tell adults that something strange or unusual has happened to them. Or bad. Or bad. Like, not that Snuffleupagus is bad, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why I said strange or unusual. Right. Um, So they had an episode where the adults see Snuffleupagus, and from then on, he's not imaginary, and all the adults adults believe that he's there. Yeah, I don't even think they made it a they thing. They just started believing like, him. They just changed it, and Snuffleupagus is now a character, and yeah. everybody knows Snuffleupagus. But this is like the opposite of that. Yeah. This is like... Well, this shows how time changes, because yeah. this was written in the 30s. Right, 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 So this was written in the 30s by someone who has the weirdest whimsical stick up her butt yeah. that I've ever seen <laughs> in anything. Okay. She is... this. The book that I read gives me the impression that the author 
is an insane control freak <laughs> and loves processes and rules more than anything. Okay. But also loves magic and whimsy. <laughs> to, a, to a point. Right. And like makes them work together. Yes. And Mary Poppins the book feels like a box into which these two things have just been crammed <laughs> and made to coexist. Yeah. And it's not that they gel badly. I can just think of other things where it gels badly better yeah but it's clear that both those ideas are there yeah like this book is full every single thing that happens with them is so focused on what the rules are of that particular occurrence right <laughs> like uh so there's the uncle albert scene right where they go and they visit her uncle albert and he's floating because he's happy and like in the movie he's floating because he's laughing right and when he laughs it makes him happy and he floats right but in the book He's only floating because it's his birthday and it happens to have fallen on a Friday. Right. So there's these sort of rules and regulations structuring the whimsy. Right. And I think this is a person who, if you said to her, like, you, like the rules you're creating, that's not necessarily whimsical. I feel like she would say, are you kidding me? Yeah. Of course it's whimsical. Of course that's whimsical. That is mathematically whimsical. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, it, I mean, it's the whole Mary. It's like the winds in the East. Like... She comes in when the wind is in the east and she leaves when the wind changes. Like mm -hmm. there there she runs on schedule like a train, but she flies in on an umbrella from somewhere. Right? What? Like Okay. We need to figure something out right now. Okay. What is she? A nanny. No, what is she? She's a nanny. She's not a nanny. <laughs> what do you think she is? I don't you know. You think she's a witch? I maybe? Okay, so let's look at it. Okay. Let's say she, she's a witch. Do witches have any kind of immortality? Yes. Are, oh, really? I don't know. It depends what kind of witch, I guess. I want to crack this right now. This is really important to me. Okay. What is she? <laughs> so what are our options? I, I don't know because there's no magical creatures in... I mean, she's she's like... There's the star. There's the star. There's the Yes, there's the star child. Mm -hmm. And the, all of the animals treat her as their queen. We know that. All of the zoo animals. They call her birthday the birthday. Yeah, birthdays keep coming up. Yeah, birthdays are very important. I feel like people forgot P.L. Travers' birthday a lot. Yeah. Well, she had a, a rough childhood, we're given to understand, yes. in the backwoods of Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's, here's my thought on this. We see Mary Poppins through the eyes of children. Yes. Ranging from... So in the book, by the way, there's four children, not two. Mm -hmm. And the youngest two are twins, ba babies of under a year old. And we see Mary Poppins through the eyes of these children. And we know that because we see the parents through the eyes of the children, even though it's an omniscient narrator, the the way that like the father's job is described is very much how a child would imagine. Like um, the narration says, Mr. Banks worked in a bank and he went home every day and he made money. And he, the, the interpretation of that is he went and he stamped out coins and he brought them home in a bag. That's what, quote, making money means. Of course, that's not his job. Like, as adults, we understand his job is not literally to stamp out the coins in the bank and then bring them home in his bag. Yeah. Um, but that is what the narrator says his job is. So we're given to understand that the narrator's understanding of what adults do is very much through the eyes of children. And so the thing about Mary Poppins is that... I feel like to a child that doesn't know how things actually are supposed to work, anything that Mary Poppins does is not any more or less magical or mystifying than anything that a regular adult does because what they do is seems very strange and mystifying. So a child doesn't necessarily know that people aren't supposed to fly and animals aren't supposed to talk. And when you pull something out of a bag, you can't pull something bigger than the bag that it came in out of the bag, unless it's the TARDIS. Uh, I don't even watch Doctor Who and I know that. <laughs> um, to me, that's what that is. It's just all of this stuff is happening, but the stuff that Mary Poppins is doing is not any weirder than the stuff that any of the other adults are doing. What's your impression? You, you think she's like some sort of mystical creature and we need to crack this? She's a god. You think she's a god? I think she is a Greek god. Okay. I think she is a god, much like the Greek gods, lives on Olympus and periodically comes down like Zeus coming down as a bull to a lady that he wants to lay with. Wow. She takes the form of a nanny to help British children. 
My impression of P.L. Travers is only through the movie Saving Mr. Banks as played by Emma Thompson. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if you said that to that character, she would look at you and say, what are you talking about? She's not a god. She's Mary Poppins. She is just herself. The explanation that Mary Poppins simply is, is ultimately unsatisfying (laughs) for me. All right. Well, God forbid you, a 35-year-old man, should not be satisfied by this children's book almost 100 years old it is my show okay all right all right i want to be satisfied with this i want to be clear anytime i am talking about mary poppins the character Uh whether the book or the movie i am talking about a god who has chosen periodically to take the form of a nanny named Mary Poppins. This is new to me, by the way. I saved it just for this occasion. <laughs> um, I don't want to do back of the book. Okay, go for it. Okay, this is Mary Poppins' revised edition. We'll, we'll talk about why it's revised in a minute. A gust of wind, a terrific bang, and Mary Poppins, nanny extraordinaire, arrives at the bank's household to care for Jane, Michael, and the twins. Faster than you can say, spit spot to bed, Mary Poppins takes charge of the excited children. Who wouldn't love a nanny whose magic makes nasty medicine taste like strawberry ice, whose empty carpet bag produces a small folding armchair, and who slides up the banister when Mrs. Banks isn't looking? Readers of all ages will delight in meeting the enchanting Mary Poppins and her strange and wonderful friends. Okay, I have something to say about this. Please. This is a summary that was written after the movie came out because it's literally chosen the only three things from the book that are in the movie. Totally, totally. And put them on the back of the book uh, of the book to such an extent that I don't think she says spit spot to bed in the book. I'm I, not convinced she does. No, I think she does. Okay. I, I really do think that's in here. Okay, well, I tried to find it in the book, but that's dumb and impossible. So I I believe she says spit spot in the book. Okay, here's what I think we should do as quickly as possible. I think that people who haven't read the book, because each chapter is just an episode, Mm -hmm. right? They, they, They aren't super related to each other, and there aren't that many chapters. I think they would be interested to hear... Just a quick summary of every ch- every adventure that they have in this book, because I think it is different from the movie in ways that people may not understand, and that'll give us a good in to talk about it. So if you don't mind, here's what I would like to do. Okay. Um, I'm going to read out the chapter names, and you try to summarize them as quickly as you can. Cool. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. There's There's 12 chapters. Cool. Okay. Chapter one. East wind. Yeah, so there's a family and then and there's like kids and the nanny quits and they put an ad in the paper for a nanny and Mary Poppins shows up. Correct. That's that's the chap chapter one na- Mary Poppins shows up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh I just found spit spot into bed. Aha. It's on page thirteen. <laughs> Fantastic. Chapter two, the day out. Okay, so in this chapter, this uh, all right. So let's just talk about saving Mr. Banks. Yes. This movie, I don't I don't buy it. Because? There's so much stuff in it that makes no sense to me. In Saving Mr. Banks, you're in talking In Saving about. Mr. Banks, yeah. So there is a moment where Travers mm-hmm. is talking to the writer of the movie. Yes. And the question comes up about whether Mary Poppins and Bert are in love. Yes. Okay. And she, in the movie, is very against this. Adamant. Adamant that they are not. And this is a stupid thing because I read the book and Mary Poppins and Bert 100% have a thing for each other. There, there's, I mean, the second chapter of the book, this is before really anything happens with the children. The second chapter of the book is Mary Poppins and Bert, the matchman, by the way, not a chimney sweep, Yep. Uh, go on a date. Yeah. That's, that is the second chapter of the book. The children aren't there. It's her day off. They go on a date together through the chalk painting and they meet the penguins and everybody, but the children are not there. And it's like, honestly, if I didn't see the Saving Mr. Banks thing and have her go, no, they're absolutely not in love, I wouldn't have a problem with it. I actually think this chapter is really sweet. I think the two of them are adorable. I would like to provide some textual evidence, if I may. Yes, please. So Bert, just like in the in the movie that you may be familiar with, is like drawing his chalk portraits on the, on the sidewalk. Ahem, said Mary Poppins with a ladylike cough. He turned with a start and saw her. Mary, he cried, and you could tell by the way he cried it that Mary Poppins was a very important person in his life. Mary Poppins looked down at her feet and rubbed the toe of one shoe along the pavement two or three times. Then she smiled at the shoe in such a way that the shoe knew quite well that the smile wasn't meant for it. 
they're so cute. They're just like cute flirting with each other. Yeah. They're adorable. Yeah. I actually love Mary Poppins and Bert in the book. Oh, by the way, they hold hands. And this was written in 1934? Yeah. Yeah, like that's, that's just like basically boning. Th- it's 1934 and a kid's book. A children's book. They are having sex. Yes. Gross. He is having sex with a god. Chapter three. Mm-hmm. Laughing gas. Okay, so this is the thing from the movie. Yes. Where they go to visit her uncle and he's floating because it's his birthday and it fell on a Friday and he's happy. Yes. And when all those three things happen together, he floats. That's correct. And then all the kids float and like Bert's not there. So that's no, a thing. No, Bert's not there. Like Bert's barely in the book. He's in this, he's in that chapter and he shows up later, doesn't he? Yes, I think so. I think when the star child is there, Bert is there. Yeah. Anyway, keep anyway, going. Anyway, they go and they have a tea party and it's a whole thing. And it's basically, it's, it's basically the scene from the movie. Yeah. The, the other thing about Mary Poppins in the book that I think should be understood is Mary Poppins is extremely vain of her own appearance. Um, I have an explanation for that. And every chapter pretty much starts with what new piece of clothing Mary Poppins is wearing and how wonderful she thinks that she looks in it. Okay, so here's the deal. I bet most people have the experience. I know I do. I, I, I'm going to ask if you do. Do you have the experience of being able to dress up for something? Yeah. Like to go to a work function or a party or a wedding and you don't really and most of us don't dress up that much Mm -hmm. but when we do dress up we like i check myself out in the mirror more often on a day that i dress up yeah because i feel good in a suit with a tie and everything me too yeah her vanity is to me more evidence that whoever she is inside is not often a human being oh my god so those few times that she is a human being or it is a human being it's going to be really vain because it's not often looking like this and it's not often dressing in clothing. I don't think we have had any episode prior to this where you had like a fan theory that was just the backbone of the episode. We've never done anything where the main character made this little sense. Okay. I guess that's fair. Not a wrinkle in time. No, a wrinkle in time is like clear. All right. I found that to be clear. All right. Let's keep going. Okay. Chapter four, Miss Lark's Andrew. So this is the chapter that when I read reread the book, I said to you, there's a chapter in this book you're going to like. It's about a dog. It's all about the old lady, the old like rich lady who lives on, there, on the cherry tree lane, mm-hmm. who has a little dog named Andrew, yes. who is very well uh, cared for. Yes. And gets dressed up in, he has multiple sweaters and he's taken care of, but all he wants in the world is to hang out with his best friend, who's a street dog, and who, in my mind, looks just like Oscar. Yeah, he's just a normal dog. They, they're like, can you find the description of the dog? Yeah, because Oscar's not those breeds, but the description of him is exactly what our dog is. Yeah, totally. Andrew's most special friend was more than common. He was a byword. He was half an Airedale and half a Retriever and the worst half of both. This is our dog, Oscar, except Golden Retriever and Dachshund yeah. instead. Yes. That is our dog. No. Uh, no, this is a super fun chapter. Yes. This is great. And the dogs are great. And like they talk and Mary Poppins. Okay. Admittedly, there's a thing I forgot in the movie where Mary Poppins can talk to dogs. Yeah. You were really mad. You called me in and you were like, why didn't they put this in the movie that she can talk to dogs? I was like, she totally can talk to dogs. She has a whole conversation with the dog in the movie. I was really embarrassed. (laughs) I want to just own it and let everybody know I forgot that she can talk to dogs. (laughs) And this is a whole chapter where she talks to dogs. But of course, like everything, she gaslights everybody because everyone's like, Mary Poppins, you are 100% talking to these dogs. And she says, no, you're full of shit. I am not talking to these dogs. And they're like, yeah, but you are. Are. And she's like, whatever, and then leaves. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, chapter five, mm-hmm. The Dancing Cow. This was a weird one. Yeah. This was just her telling the kids like a bedtime story. Yeah, because Jane was sick. Yeah, and so it's a story within a story. It's just her telling a fable of a cow that got a shooting star stuck on its horn, and then it couldn't stop dancing, and there's a king, and the king uh, is trying to figure out why she keeps dancing, and then he's like, oh, you got a star in your horn, and he takes it off, and she's like, cool, and everything's fine. Yeah, and the whole thing is that her mother knew the cow. Yes. So her mother can apparently talk to cows. Right. And also, this is going along with the whole... So let's say she was God in a monotheistic view. She wouldn't have a mother at that point, right? Sure. But in a polytheistic view, like, again, I'm thinking the Greek and Roman gods for this. Yeah. Of course they... Like, of course she would have a mother. All right. And there is an immortality factor among all of this. All right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Chapter six. Bad Tuesday. This... 
is the one that we need to talk about for a second because this book gets added to the list of books that used to be problematic and then people were like, hey, don't be shitty. And the author was like, okay, fine, I won't be shitty. Yes. Uh, so much like Roald Dahl mm-hmm. and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory Yes. Uh, with the uh, Oompa Loompas being basically pygmies, African pygmies. Yeah. Uh, P.L. Travers wrote a chapter where Mary Poppins and the children find a compass, and the compass takes them all over the world. They go north, south, east, and west. And in this book... Well, hang on. Okay. Each time... This was in the original published version. Yes. In the original published version, every time they go to a different place in the world, they meet a person. Yeah. Who is just... A bag of stereotypes. Did you read the original one? Did you find it somewhere? I have found pieces of it. Okay, I didn't read it. Yeah. Uh, so, like, they go to Africa, and there is an African stereotype. That's when they go e- uh, west, mm-hmm. uh, maybe. And then when they go uh, east, they go to, um, like... Asia. Asia, and there is a Chinese person, and it's really bad. So this book was published in 1934. Mm-hmm. So basically, people got mad, and so she revised it. Yes. So she revised it. To make the people less offensive. Yes. Then people got mad again and they were like, yeah, you, you made them less offensive, but they're still offensive. And yes. she's like, fine, fuck it. I'll make them animals. Yes. And so she makes them animals. Yes. So they meet like a polar bear. Yeah, like a polar bear and a snake or a and bird a panda. and a panda. Yeah. So quick timeline. When was the book written? 1934. When did the movie come out? 1964. When was the first revision? Like 1965. 1967. Yeah. Very, very close. Uh, do you know when the last revision was? Yes, I do. When was that? 1981. Yup. So <laughs> that the, was this book. Like Th- this is ni- this is 1981. Mm-hmm. This is the new one. The movie that we all like know and most like 100 percent of us know it, and of the people who've seen it, 99 percent of us love it. Yeah. When it came out, if you as a viewer went to the bookstore or the library to get a copy of Mary Poppins, yeah. there was a super fucking racist chapter yeah. in it. And this is also the chapter in which Michael is just super naughty. Like, he's the worst. Like, that's why it's Bad Tuesday, because he's yeah. just like, everything, I just woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and everything I do is going to be the worst, and I'm going to, like, kick the babies and, like, steal stuff and push the maid down while she's carrying boiling water like he's really bad he's the worst it's funny that you bring up sesame street before because this is making i feel like i'm bringing my whole childhood into this episode yeah because this is a thing for kids you know for kids yeah for kids um this makes me think of mr rogers who i know is not your favorite person no but like do you, you know what do you do with the mad that you feel no i don't know that did you ever see the video of him like making a plea to um a committee at the senate for uh, funding for PBS. Uh, sure. He basically, he reads the lyrics of what do I, what do you do with the mad that you feel? Okay. And it's like maybe one of the best things that Mr. Rogers ever wrote. Okay. And it's all about what do you do on those days when you're acting like this piece of shit yeah. on this bad Tuesday. But the emotional intelligence of what he wrote is staggering compared to what P.L. Travers wrote in this book. Which because, is just, he was like, he was bad and he didn't know why. And then he wasn't. And then he wasn't. And then suddenly he's fine. Yeah. And I feel like the way she treats emotion, emotion is completely unexplainable and often mysterious, Uh which is exactly what a god who is not a human being would assume about. Okay. You've taken this farther than I'm willing. She's written it through the perspective of Mary Poppins. You've taken this farther than I'm willing to go. Okay. Uh, Chapter seven, the bird woman. Uh, Well, this is the really nice thing from the book where there's, uh, from the movie rather, where there's the woman who uh, will sell you a bag of bird seed to feed the birds for a tuppence a bag. Yes. But they also go to visit their father in his office. But they do not cause mischief. No, there's no mischief. There's no mischief. I think this might be a good time to acknowledge one big thing. Yeah. About the adaptation of the book to the movie. Yes. As portrayed in the movie Saving Mr. Banks. Go ahead. Okay. So the movie Saving Mr. Banks is called Saving Mr. Banks because there's a big scene where Walt Disney, uh, Walt Tom Hanks Disney, set, or is it Tom Walt Disney Hanks? It's Tom Walt Disney Hanks. Okay. Where he says to Emma P.L. Travers Thompson. That, yeah, that right? tracks. That, that, okay, yeah, yeah, that tracks. He says to her, yeah, Mary Poppins gets there and saves the Banks children. And she goes, are you fucking kidding me? Did you even read the book? You didn't get it at all. And that's like the big conflict in the second and third act. Yeah. And what she says to him, she's not there to save the kids. She's there to save Mr. Banks. Yes. And that's why the main arc of the movie is that Mr. Banks has an arc yeah. and learns to accept whimsy into his life. Yeah. That's not in the book. No, it's not in the book. Like, maybe. That's okay. No, no, no. 
hang on. So judgment about whether it's in the book. All right. It made me mad, not at P.L. Travers, because I understand that Emma Thompson's portrayal of this character is not the person. Mm -hmm. I'm not mad at P.L. Travers. I'm a little mad at the movie Saving Mr. Banks for making me think that when I read this book, there was going to be anything about Mr. Banks in it. There's not really. Not He's there, but like it doesn't have much to do with him. And if it's in any of the sequels, like this book came out. And then three more came out before the movie Mary Poppins came out. Mm -hmm. But they were written over the course of years. And this movie was something Walt Disney was trying to make for decades. Yes. So I'm kind of mad at the movie Saving Mr. Banks for positing something that doesn't really borne out by the evidence. So like reading the book Mary Poppins, it's about the kids. Yeah. Like I wouldn't fault anybody for thinking that Mary Poppins is there for the kids. Because that's what's in the book. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. And then they made a really interesting choice in the movie to make it about Mr. Banks. But like, I don't know that that was in the books. Yeah. But uh, I find I find it interesting. I, I appreciate that you find it interesting. Do you want to continue with the chapters of the book? I think people would rather hear me yell about this. You seem like you're really mad at Mary Poppins. I am not mad at <laughs> Mary Poppins. Okay. I really enjoyed Mary Poppins Returns. Uh-huh. I enjoyed reading this book. Uh-huh. I enjoyed the movie Mary Poppins more, much, much more than I remember that's enjoying fair. it. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. The only like thing that we watched that I have a problem with is Saving Mr. Banks. Okay. Which was a delightful movie, but I think it was kind of bullshit. Okay. Chapter eight, Mrs. Corey. I like barely remember this one. This is the Eating Fingers one. This is the Eating Fingers one, yeah. Help me remember. Okay. In the movie, as you may recall, there's a little nod to this chapter because in the very beginning when Bert, the one-man band, is singing, he says, Mrs. Corey, your daughters were as small as you, but they grew. So in the book, there's this very, very, very old woman named Mrs. Corey, and she's got two enormous daughters. Mm -hmm. Um, Who she is unbelievably shitty to. Yes, she's very shitty to them. And then... Later on in the movie, um, Mary Poppins says to the children, we're going to Mrs. Corey's to buy gingerbread and they're very excited. But then but they never get there because Andrew, the dog, stops them in the park. And that's why they have to go to her uncle's because he's laughing on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So there is there are nods to this chapter in the movie. But if you haven't read the book, I don't think you would notice. Yeah. So this now I'm remembering it. And I think the reason I didn't remember is because I blocked it because Mrs. Corey's a piece of shit. Yeah. And is super, super mean to her daughters who just happen to be big yeah well the thing that i like about this chapter is that it has some of like the sort of um boring stuff of mary poppins's day-to-day that you don't see in the movie like she has to go on errands with the children she goes to the the butcher and the fishmonger and then she so then this is the part i wanted to read out because michael is being a child but also like a whiny piece of shit and mary poppins is so mean to him like in a way again If your only exposure to Mary Poppins is the movie, this is what the movie is based on. I just want you to listen to how mean Mary Poppins is to this tiny child. Jeremy, would you like to portray the role of Michael, the tiny, wee, whiny child? Yes. Great. Outside on the pavement, she paused, looking at her list and ticking off what she had bought. Michael stood first on one leg and then on the other. Mary Poppins, are we never going home? He said crossly. You said that very sadly. It says he said crossly. Mary Poppins, are we never going home? Was that better? Yes, you took direction very well. Thank you. Mary Poppins turned and regarded him with something like disgust. That, she said briefly, is as it may be. And Michael, watching her fold up her list, wished he had not spoken. You can go home if you like, she said haughtily. We are going to buy the gingerbread. Michael's face fell. If only he had managed to say nothing. He hadn't known that gingerbread was at the end of the list. That's your way, said Mary Poppins shortly, pointing in the direction of Cherry Tree Lane. If you don't get lost, she added as an afterthought. Oh, no, Mary Poppins, please, no. I didn't mean it, really. I, oh, Mary Poppins, please, cried Michael. Do let him come, Mary Poppins, said Jane. I'll push the perambulator if only you'll let him come. Mary Poppins sniffed. If it wasn't Friday, she said darkly to Michael, you'd go home Was that a... darkly? Hey, who's directing this? You or me? I'm just saying this is a joint effort. If it wasn't Friday, she said darkly to Michael, you'd go home in a twink, in an absolute twink. So 
Mary Poppins is really mean to the children. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, but then they do go and buy gingerbread. And then it turns out, I tried to find out what this was. That apparently there's like gold paper stars on the gingerbread. And I was trying to find out if like that was a thing. I couldn't find anything about it. But apparently, unfortunately, I think this plays into your theory a little bit. The, the children like collect and keep their gold paper stars from the gingerbread. And then Mary Poppins and Mrs. Corey paste them back into the sky she's and they a, become real stars. She is a god. She can control the stars in the sky. And Mrs. Corey's an asshole to her daughters. Chapter nine. I just don't like the body shaming. There's no reason for I'm, it. I'm sorry. Like we watched the movie and yeah, he talks about the two big daughters and they're there and it's like a little body shamey and that's it's fine. It's really about height. It's yeah. And then in the book, she's a piece of shit. We're going to move on. Mm -hmm. Chapter nine. Okay. John and Barbara's story. Yeah, this is okay. So this one's the really sad chapter. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically the growing up chapter. Yeah. It's the Polar Express chapter. It's the one where you get old enough that you can't remember the things you knew when you were a little kid. Yeah. So like when you're a tiny little baby, you can talk to animals and all this kind of stuff. But then eventually you reach the point where you forget how to do that. When you're one. When yeah. you turn one. So there's like four main characters of this chapter. It's the two babies and then a bird and Mary Poppins. Right. And there's this super, super heartbreaking scene at the end of the chapter where the bird comes to the window and she, the bird has been talking to the kids the entire chapter and suddenly the kids can't understand the bird and the bird's like oh I miss my friends. The well the bird is crying and Mary Poppins makes fun of him for crying that's actually super sad but, but I don't really blame her because she doesn't understand human emotion. Because she's a god. Because she is a god. This, this chapter is fucking heartbreaking. Yeah. I really really enjoyed it. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Chapter 10. Full moon. This is the zoo right? This is the zoo. Yeah. Okay. So it's Mary Poppins' birthday and the kids in the middle of the night go to the zoo. And this is the one you were talking about before where all the animals are like the people and the people are in the cages and it's Mary Poppins' birthday. Yes. And, and they're she, celebrating her birthday. And like she's, a, here's, okay. She's totally cool with all of the people being on display in the cages and all of the animals being outside the cages because to her, people and animals are no different because she is neither one of those groups. She's a god. You really, yeah, I mean. Chapter 11. Chapter 11. Christmas shopping. Okay, this is the star chapter. This is the star child. This is the one that comes out of left field. This is the one that like nothing that approaches this level of fantasy I think is in the movie. Yeah. Because they go shopping and a little girl shows up and she's one of the Pleiades. Right. She's literally a star. And she comes down and did you ever uh, read or see Stardust? No. It made me think of that a lot. Okay. It was actually really nice reading this and seeing kind of where a lot of the fantasy that I like got inspiration from this book. Mm -hmm. And I would be super interested to find out, like, I would love to know, and if anybody has any insight into this, how many stories are inspired by the idea of a person coming to Earth and it turns out they are actually a star. Mm -hmm. Because, like, the, the whole plot of Stardust is about a star coming to Earth, and it's a star. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. So it's a little girl. She's one of the Pleiades, and she's running around a store buying stuff for her sisters. Yes. Who are the other Except Pleiades. she doesn't have any money. <laughs> well, no, because she's a star. Yeah. But Mary Poppins does. Yeah. Because even the... Well, she's a god, but she has a job. Yes. And she also gives her her gloves that she's very proud of. Right. Because, well, here's the thing, too. She doesn't get to have gloves that often because she doesn't have hands that often. Well, neither does the star, apparently. And she understood that she understands what the plight is of someone who is an anthropomorphic being. Last chapter. That's probably, I'm using that wrong, but Chap go on. Chapter 12. Yeah. West Wind. Mary leaves. She leaves. She leaves. This was the chapter where I was expecting there to be something about Mr. Banks. Like, does he even appear in it? Yes. Yes. And in fact, this is the part where he gets saved. Really? Yes. Let me read something out to you. Okay. They always remembered that particular morning. For one thing, it was the first time they were allowed to come downstairs for breakfast. And for another, Mr. Banks lost his black bag. So that the day began with two extraordinary happenings. Where is my bag? Shouted Mr. Banks, turning round and round in the hall like a dog chasing its tail. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. At last, Mr. Banks discovered the bag himself in his study, and he rushed into the hall with it, holding it aloft. Now, he said, as though he were delivering a sermon, my bag is always kept in one place. Here, on the umbrella stand. Who put it in the study? He roared. You did, my dear, when you took the income tax papers out of it last night, said Mrs. Banks. Mr. Banks gave her such a hurt look that she wished she had been less tactless and had said she had put it there herself. 
Is this the... Wait, how does he get saved, though? Hang on. <laughs> Did this not play out the way you expected it to? Yeah, because that's Mr. Banks' last appearance in the book. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't get saved. He doesn't get saved at all. Which, again, I don't have a problem with P.L. Travers about this. I don't have a problem with the movie Mary Poppins about it. I only have a problem with the movie Saving Mr. Banks because he doesn't get saved. Okay, fair enough. Blah. Do you have anything else to say about the book Mary Poppins? It's super fun. It's fun. I have. It's rare that I read a book that, like I said before, that is so whimsical, but also so obsessed with the rules of something. Mm -hmm. It's like the most controlled, specific whimsy I've ever seen. Yeah. Like Harry Potter kind of got me that way where she explains, every, I only read the first book, like she explains. <laughs> You're going to get in trouble. I got in trouble a couple episodes ago for saying I didn't know much about Harry Potter. I already got in trouble for saying that I'd never watched the West Wing. Yeah, and, and you now watched I, all seven I, seasons. I watched all of it because like one person got mad that I hadn't, no, like multiple people got mad that I hadn't seen it. Yeah. I haven't read all the Harry Potter books. I feel like J.K. Rowling really likes to explain every single magical thing in Harry Potter. Uh -huh. And I feel like that, in part, comes from a tradition that P.L. Travers is part of, which is explaining every single magical thing. Yeah. And it's like, rules based. <laughs> it is basically rules based whimsy, which is its own kind of flavor of delightful. I enjoyed the book. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess the only other thing I have to say is just in passing, I think it's pretty clear that the female character is not underwritten. Like, Mary Poppins is the major agent for change and the impetus for all the adventures in this entire book. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even if you accept the proposition that she is a god. Which, which she is. I don't. Um, she is in human form as a human lady and is treated as such, but... I don't think that there's nothing in the book where anybody like says Mary oh Mary Poppins you can't do this thing because you're a lady like it just doesn't really enter into it no not at all yeah um so th that's my that's my nod to the female character is um quite reasonably written in this book mm -hmm. I also have a I, I I have a before we move on to the movie because this is a character that is Sir not appearing in this film, I have a nomination, oh. which I don't often. I usually just agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is different from who you wanted to nominate. Um, my nomination is Robertson A. <laughs> <laughs> I liked him. I liked him so much. He's just like their lazy gardener that Mr. Banks is always annoyed and frustrated with because he doesn't do his job. But he won't fire because nobody else is as cheap, I think, as but Robertson also, A. But also, just to be clear, he is lazy and doesn't do his he, job. Yeah, no, he's lazy and doesn't do his job. Um, But somehow, I just, I really like that Robertson A has, like, figured out his life in that way. Like, I'm lazy and won't do my job, but also no one will ever fire me because I don't charge them that much for not doing my job. <laughs> I really appreciated Robertson A. I liked him. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of a, this might actually be a good segue. I can think of a couple other people who uh -huh. would be nominees for sure not appearing in this film. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, there were there were definitely um, three characters that went to the top of my list, okay. but I believe I have my nominees. Go ahead. I, I do think the star, does she have a name? I can't remember. Maya. Maya. I really, really enjoyed that chapter because it's so unlike anything that's in the movie mm -hmm. and it's delightful. Yeah. And Mary Poppins actually sacrifices something. Mm -hmm. And I just like the idea of a star being a person. Yeah. Uh, she's on there, but... In all, in all honesty, I have one nominee for Sir Not Appearing in this film. Go and ahead. it is a joint nomination okay. for the twins. Okay. <laughs> they do not appear in this movie even a little. They just cut down on the number of children that the Banks family had. Yeah, because you don't need babies. No. Stupid babies. Well, I love how they're introduced in the very beginning. I'm not going to read it, but it's something like they lived in like the shabbiest house on a nice street. And like... Mr. Banks had told Mrs. Banks she could either have a nice house or four children, and she chose to have the four children because <laughs> they're kind of poor. They're not poor. They're middle class. Yeah. Let's talk about this movie. Okay. So I don't know if people were aware of this, but in 1964, Walt Disney Pictures... Yeah, this, this, obscure, stu this obscure studio... Independent studio released a big old movie mm -hmm. called... Big Technicolor Mary film. Poppins. Am I reading the back of the box? I think you are because you're holding the box. Released from the Disney vault in celebration of its 50th anniversary. We this... paid money for this, by the way. <laughs> this beloved classic shines like never before on Blu-ray with an all-new digital restoration. The reason I'm interrupting so many times. Jeremy was like, we don't have to read the back of the box. It's the same as the book. And I said, no, the reason I like reading the back of the box on Blu-ray specifically is that 99% of the time, it's basically an advertisement for 
the fact that it's a Blu-ray. There's like a little picture on it that talks about the digital restoration. Okay, can you look at this little picture? I'm going to take a picture of this and try to share it somehow. There's a little thing showing there's a digital restoration and there's a picture of Dick Van Dyke with the penguins Mm -hmm. of what it used to look like. And then a picture of what it looks like after the restoration. I want to look at it. Spoiler alert. It is literally exactly the same image. (laughs) Someone didn't think it through. It could not be more similar. It is the same image. Winner of five Academy Awards, including Best Actress for Julie Andrews, Best Song, Chim Chim Cherry, and Best Special Visual Effects, Mary Poppins is a movie experience your family will enjoy over and over again. Practically perfect in every way, Mary Poppins flies out of the windy London skies and into the home of two mischievous children. With the help of a carefree chimney sweep named Bert, Dick Van Dyke, the spirited nanny turns every chore into a game and every day into a jolly holiday. Oh boy. Share the music, the magic, and the joy of Mary Poppins with a whole new generation for the first time on Disney Blu-ray, which is the same as Blu-ray. It's just more expensive. I just can't believe that out of all the songs from this film, the one that won the Oscar was Chim Chim Cherie. Okay, so we found that out before we watched the movie, and then we watched the movie, and I think it makes perfect sense. Okay, why? Chim Chim Cherie's in the whole goddamn movie. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. It's there the whole time, and it's there, it's like... It's up-tempo and down-tempo and, like, major key and minor key and someone who knows something about music can probably tell me why I'm wrong. I, I just, th- for some reason, I thought Chim Chim Cherie and Step in Time were the same song, like, one led into the other. Because I was like, oh, Step in Time, like, that's a great song when they're all, like, tap dancing on the rooftops with the chimney sweeps. But Chim Chim Cherie is a different song. This is one of those ones where I absolutely think, so in Mary Poppins Returns, it's the lamplighters all yeah. singing a song. Yeah. Uh, that whole sequence I thought was better than Step in Time. I think Step in Time's fine. I like Step in Time. I like the new one better. Okay. Well, Chim Chim Cherie is the same. Is It's the um, the the London Sky. There's a song about the London Sky in Mary Poppins Returns, and that's the same as Chim Chim Cherie. And I like that one better. You like the London Sky song better? I love it because it's there's an irony in the new one that I think isn't in the old one. Because it's talking about like the bright sunshine and it's like dark, foggy London. I loved it. Okay. I thought it was super, super fucking funny. Okay. It's fine that you thought it was great. I'm just... I want to make the comparison. I feel like I have to, I feel like I have to give evidence for why I thought the new one was better than the old one. Okay. I will say that like usually when we do these episodes, right, like by the time we're done with the episode, whatever it is that we're talking about, I'm so sick of that I never want to talk about it or watch it or do anything with it ever again. This is, I feel like this is the first time that talking about it has made me want to watch the movie again. Like I want to watch Mary Poppins again, like right now. Mm Mm-hmm. I get that. Yeah. I totally get that. Like I said, I came out of this whole thing liking it way more than I ever did before. Yeah. So I want to talk about just the making of the movie. Okay. A couple of quick bullet points. It took 20 years for it to get made. Yes. Because Walt Disney was trying to make this movie for a really long time. And P.L. Travers was recalcitrant. Right. Now, I think that's what that means. Hey, No, I think you're right. I think so too. I think it's important to lay the groundwork for a point that I would like to make. Okay. You're not making the point. You're just laying the groundwork for making the point. Right. I'm have, doing that now. I, I had two goals for this episode. Uh-huh. One, Mary Poppins is a god. You, you you have made your position eminently clear. I think we can move on. Two. Number two, uh, Mary Poppins the movie is better than Mary Poppins the book. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. I've thought about this a lot. Yeah. I think that the movie Mary Poppins is better at being a movie than the book Mary Poppins is at being a book. Okay. It is such a classic movie that is so beloved and has so many wonderful people in it and is technologically so interesting and is like the high watermark of Disney live action. Truly. Like... The point I'm trying to make is not, oh, yeah, the movie Mary Poppins is good, but the book is bad. Like, no, the book's great. The book's uh-huh. the book's really good. But the movie was more engaging, more interesting, and stuck with me more than the book did. I'm willing to go with you on that. This and- is a really... I mean, here's the deal. Like, right, when I was a kid, this was a movie that I really liked and had. And this is a book that I really liked and had. And I genuinely don't 
really ever remember making a connection between the two of them. Like, like I knew that they were the same thing, but I don't think I really understood they were the same thing because they're so different. They're very different. Just in tone, they're very different. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to just put that out there. Yeah. So this movie was produced by the Walt Disney Company. It was. When, when Papa Walt was still at the Disney Company. And he died like... Only like six years after this. He died in 1970, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or 1966, maybe. He died at a very young age. He died at 60 of lung cancer because he was a heavy smoker. Right. Which is in the movie, which is in Saving yeah. Mr. Banks. Don't smoke, children. No, don't. Please don't. Just if you smoke, just try to not smoke. It's bad for you. You should stop. <laughs> we would like you to stop. I would like you to stop. Mm -hmm. It was written by Bill Walsh and Don DeGrady from the book. Uh, Don DeGrady, who was played by uh, Bradley Whitford yes. in the movie, who is a delight. Yes. I can say that now having seen Seven Seasons of the West Wing. There it is. Bradley Whitford's great. I liked him before. I love him now. Keep going. Music by Richard and Bob Sherman. Mm -hmm. Brothers. Who were portrayed by B.J. Novak and Jason Schwartzman in the movie. One had a limp. Uh, yes. Yes. That's true. B.J. Novak Because of the war. Um, and then we have our cast. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this cast. Yes couple of people just want to get it out of the way kind of quick. Okay. So Ed Wynn is yeah. Uncle Albert. And he died again like two years after yeah. this. Yeah. He's also the voice of the Mad Hatter. Yeah. In Alice in Wonderland. Disney Disney treasure. He's great. And yeah. that's one of the best scenes in the movie. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. Um, this was a cool one. Elsa Lanchester. Oh my God. I lost my mind because yeah. I did not know this. And, and who does she play? She plays Katie Nana. And She's the nanny that quits in the first scene during the song Sister Suffragette. Is there anything else that she is, would you say, known for? She's the fucking Bride of Frankenstein. She's a goddamn Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> if you know it's her, it's very, it, you can recognize her. I would call her very recognizable. Okay. If you know. If you know. Uh, Hermione Badele is Ellen. Yeah. She's the maid. Mm -hmm. She's very funny. Uh, this was something, so this just kind of speaks to how much uh, this movie was not like a part of my life. When we went to go see Mary Poppins Returns, Julie Walters is in it as mm -hmm. Ellen. Yeah. I didn't understand it was the same character. Ah. I, I didn't know. Oh, I did. Um, and then we watch this and someone calls her Ellen and I go, wait a second. Yeah. And I had a question and you gave me an answer because I was a dummy. Well, no. Glynis Johns oh as Winifred Banks. A couple things about Glynis Johns. Okay. A of all. Yeah. She's still living. She's like 100 years old. Glynis, if you're listening, you're great. We're she a fan. sings my favorite song of I, all time. Certainly my favorite Disney song, no joke. But we watch this and it's like I mean, I don't like I I don't like the fact that the way that they're portraying the fact that the mother is a suffragette means that she neglects her children in favor of being a suffragette like that part's not good but the song that she sings is not ironic and is not making fun of her for being a suffragette it is a full-throated anthem to women's liberation and it just I love it more and more I listen I watch that the clip of that song on YouTube like pretty frequently I love that song so much sister suffragette if you don't know if you don't know the song Go and listen to it. It's amazing. It's very good. It's so good. She's great. My She's favorite part of that song is when she gets the cook and the maid to sing along with her. And Ellen, the maid, is singing like kind of reluctantly. But the cook is in like full voice support. It's so good. I love it. How do you feel about the difference between Mrs. Banks in the movie versus in the book? Well, she's certainly more of a character in the movie. Like she has her own wants and desires and dreams. She's not just a mother because I feel like the the way that the book suffers a little bit in telling the mother's story is just like what I was saying before is that everything is through the eyes of the children. And this is very universal. As a child, you don't see your parents as human beings. The only thing your mother is, is a mother. She's nothing else. Like, that is what she is to you. Um, so that's all she is in the book. She's a mother she, who's concerned about her children and sometimes interacts with her husband. But in the movie, they gave her a whole other life to give an explanation to why she had to turn her children over to be raised by a nanny, which is that she is... Uh, very caught up in the cause of votes for women, mm -hmm. which I love. And this was something that had to do, because there's a whole time shift. Because, like, the book was published in the 30s, and it takes place in the 30s. You think so? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, this was something I was reading about, where when they made the movie, they wanted to shift it to Edwardian England. Okay. Which, of course, the suffra the women's suffrage w movement was in full swing at that point. Of course. But by the 30s, it was over. Yeah. So she wouldn't, if they had kept the original time period, she, she wouldn't have even been into that. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, do you know why they did that? Did they want it to be kind of like pre-war, like sort of a more innocent 
time. Maybe. Yeah. I, I think so, but I honestly don't know. Yeah. I, di- I didn't really find out much about that. Because the song that Mr. Banks sings about how it's grand to be an Englishman in 1910, it's the age of men, is very like... Like there's no there's no like prescience in this of like a war is coming really but like of course World War One would have been would be starting only a few years after this but I feel like the sense of like richness and security of Mr. Banks is kind of what they were going for like I think just so. this is this is my life and I'm the king of my castle and nothing will ever change. Mm-hmm. Speaking of yes, let's talk about David Tomlinson. Oh my god, I love him so much. Of of. The other Disney classic, Bedknobs and Broomsticks. Mm-hmm. Yes. He's so fucking good. He's Mr. Banks. I don't know that we explicitly just said that. Yeah. Yeah. He's so good. Yeah. Like everyone, who are the two people that everyone talks about when they talk about this movie? Mary Poppins and Bert. Right. Mr. Banks should be one of the people that people talk about. Well, he was like, like it's in Saving Mr. Banks, like he's in the title of the movie. So it's only right that they like give him his due. But there's this like lingering shot of like the publicity shot of his face at the premiere of the movie. And it's it's very nice. He's he's very good. David Tomlinson is so good in this. Yeah. He is a fantastic actor. And if you haven't seen Bedknobs and Broomsticks, you should see it. I really want to rewatch that because it has Angela Lansbury in it too. Yeah. And in that one, he like goes off to war. Yeah, he does. Because that's also like pre-World War One. Yeah. Uh, No, that's pre-World War Two. It's World War Two. Because that's why they're in the old house. It's like it's like language oh, it's in the, the wardrobe. Yeah, that's why yeah, we were they, talking the about The children it. have been sent away. Yeah, we yeah, talked yeah, yeah. about it in our Narnia episode. Yep. yep. Narnia. Narnia. Yeah. Uh, he's great. Then we get the children. Yes. We get Karen Dotrice and Matthew Garber as Jane and Michael. So Karen Dotrice had a cameo in Mary Poppins Returns. And like I knew it was a cameo. And I started elbowing you. And you were like, who is that? And I'm like, I'm not totally sure, actually. But then I went and looked it up. And it's Karen Dotrice, um, who was only like 10 mm-hmm. in this. Poor Michael does not have a cameo because he passed away at a very, very young age. Oh, for real? Oh, did did you not come across this in your research? I didn't come across him at all, and that explains that. He died at like 21. Oh, fuck. Really? Yeah. Of yeah. what? Maybe a drug overdose. Oh, no. Like, it's controversial. Uh, yes. Well, okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah, sorry. Cool, 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 cool. Sorry to bum you out. I thought you knew that. You were the one that did the research. Well, now I feel really bad for what I'm about to say which is that Michael is one of the main reasons that I didn't like this movie when I was a kid. Okay, well, he died. Okay, well, I'm still going to talk about it. Great. Uh, I'm going to honor him and his career by talking about it uh, honestly. With respect. Yes. I just, as a kid, found Michael especially really off-putting. Yeah. He freaked me out. Okay. Michael freaked me out for some reason. I don't understand that. It's, this is a, I, I don't know. I can't explain what's going on inside my head. I can't explain my bullshit. But my bullshit led to me not liking Mary Poppins because of Michael. He just was, uh, he's like an old man child. I mean, I see what you're seeing when you say that. I understand. I just find him so charming. And I feel like the quality of the performances from both of these children is so high. Like the scene near the end where they're talking to Bert about their father. And he says, and Bert says, oh, your father loves you. And he says, no, he doesn't. I don't think he likes us at all. And they're crying is heartbreaking and so pure and so real. Like these are not mannered child actors. These are, their performances are very pure and very natural. I agree with you now. Yes. But I didn't like it as a kid. That's fair. No, I, that's fine. I'm also trying to figure out why I didn't like yeah. this movie when I was a kid. But I know that it was because of Michael. Okay. And it, I just found him very off-putting. I, now I find him very cute. Yes. He's I think great. he's very cute. The only thing that I thought was really funny when we were watching it is go back and rewatch the scene with Uncle Albert. Any time the kids are floating, like full frame, mm-hmm. that is 100% not him. But the girl, like Karen Dotrice is, is yeah, there. Yeah, like I don't understand. What, like maybe he was scared or they couldn't get him. They couldn't. He didn't fit in the harness or like something. Who knows? Maybe. Who can say? But they are very cute. Yes. And they are very good. Yes. And I have no problem with them in this movie. I'm happy to I hear it. I thought they acquitted themselves nicely. Yes. And now let's talk about the twins. Yeah. Who are played by... No one. Sir, not appearing in this there film. There we go. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, let's talk about two characters played by the same actor 
Bert and Mr. Dot. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like everyone played multiple people. Uh-huh. Like Julie Andrews is like one of the animated characters, and David Tomlinson does the voice of her cane, yeah. the parrot. <laughs> He's also the voice of uh, Admiral Booms. Uh, what's his name? His assistant. Yeah, I don't know what his, his assistant's name his is. His living, his boyfriend. It's, it's not his boyfriend. They lived. They were sailor. They met in the navy and they <laughs> lived together. No, no, it's like Archer and Woodhouse. It's like it's his Batman from the war okay all right cool he's also voiced by david tomlinson great so i feel like everybody in this movie kind of played double duty Mm -hmm. um dick van dyke is is no exception yes he played in a minor role mr dawes senior yeah and then there's mr dawes jr who's played by uh (laughs) the actor who played um uh was toodles toodles in 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 hook Hook. yeah uh is delightful person i think he passed away oh no he is no longer with us yeah he was a million in Hook. He was like a million in this. And it was, he was old. This is like one of those things. It's like, God, he was old then and he's still alive. Except he's not. Except he's not. So, and then Dick Van Dyke came back and played that character in Mary Poppins Returns. Young Mr. Dawes. Which is weird that like when you watch Mary Poppins and say, <laughs> that guy is going to grow up to be just like his dad, which is weird. Yeah. Um, What did you think of Dick Van Dyke as Mr. Dawes Sr.? Ask me how many years old I was when I realized that Mr. Dawes Sr. was also played by Dick Van Dyke. How old were you when you realized they were played by Dick Van Dyke? This many, this many years old. 34 years old. (laughs) That's such a... Today years old. That's such a delightful discovery. I did not know. I mean, I knew it before we were watching this for the podcast because I think I knew it when I was hearing publicity for Mary Poppins Returns. And in my head, I was like, oh... Yeah, that makes sense. Like, I never really thought about it, but it was definitely not something if you had asked me, I would have known. Yeah. Um, He's great. I love Dick Van Dyke. He's so delightful in this. He's so good. Can you please relate the story about his accent? I want to talk about his accent in a moment, but I want to talk first about his acting. Yes. Not his accent. Okay. How do you feel he is as your man, Bert? He's great. He is fantastic yes he is so good he is one of the most charming this was something that like so i I guess i always had it in my head that mary poppins followed the dick van dyke show Uh but it didn't no he was like the biggest star it so this was the the only thing it made me think of is in 1995 it's crazy how big tim allen was like tim allen was on the biggest sitcom in the country he was in toy story and the santa claus he had like a best-selling book yeah it's crazy how big he was yeah he was the biggest star dick van dyke was huge at that time yeah. he's so good in this yes he's so good as bert he's bert's great. like the nicest character ever bert's great i he's- forget how much bert interacts with the children like independently and how sweet he is with the children there was like a thing that i didn't get as a kid that i only recognize now the fact that he has a different job every time you see him yeah, in the movie he totally does. that just went over my head yeah, at yeah, the yeah, time yeah. like when i was a kid i thought his job was being bert yeah his, no, he's like a one man band and a sidewalk artist. And when they show up to do to do step in time, he's like, "Yeah, today I'm a chimney sweep." He's not a chimney sweep for the whole thing, um, but he's never a match man like he is in the book. I like uh, this is one of those places where I actually think that's a much more interesting kind of profession for the character. Yeah, to have no profession and yeah. do everything. He's an odd job man. Than in the book. Yeah, I think Bert's better in the movie than he is in the book. I think they were right to expand his character. Mm-hmm. He's also. Uh, a br- uh, an Englishman famously who, who talks with a Cockney accent famously so okay this is a quote from an article that was published very very recently an interview with Dick Van Dyke this warmed my heart someone should have told me I needed to work on my Cockney accent nearly everyone in the Mary Poppins cast was a Brit but no one said anything I was given an Irish coach whose Cockney was much better than mine. Years later, I asked Julie Andrews, why didn't you tell me? She said it was because I was working so hard. <laughs> it's so that cute. That paints both of them in the sweetest light. I love that. I love Dick Van Dyke. And Bert is a delight. His Cockney accent is like famously the worst accent in any movie Honestly, ever. Honestly, though. It's terrible. I don't. I don't think it's that bad. It's so bad. I don't think it's that bad. We disagree about this a little bit. But the funny thing is, like, I have a really sensitive ear for accents. Like, I'm always the one to say, oh, their accent wasn't good. 
like yeah it's bad but i don't think it's the worst thing ever committed to film no 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 no. because it's you not, know why no. i think for the same reason as julie andrews recognized is because he's working so hard that it almost sells it i'm not saying it's the worst thing committed to film i don't think anybody's saying it's the worst thing i committed think a to lot film. of people say that no i think everyone my impression because i've done a lot of reading on this my impression is everyone thinks it's delightful but also the worst accent ever committed to film. Yeah. Can you think, is there any accent that you can think of in any movie that you've ever seen that is worse than this one? Not performance, accent. Yes. What? Keanu Reeves and Dracula. Okay. (laughs) Dick Van Dyke has the second worst accent ever committed to film. Okay, fine. You picked the other one that's bad. Congratulations. Whatever. You you did it. Whatever. This is a terrible accent. All right. The thing that I thought was great about Mary Poppins Returns, he said he had a new dialect coach with him because I'm sure the old the He's old one dead. is super dead. Uh the new one he said was like with him was like they were like joined at the hip. He said they never left him alone the entire time he was working on the movie. You mean at age 91? Yeah. I thought his accent was great. It was in the great. New one. No, he's good. And actually, his accent as Mr. Dawes Sr. was good. Yeah, he just was, it was just, he wasn't trying to do Cockney. Right. I think it was the Cockney that really was the hard part. Oh, poor, poor guy. Bless him. He's the sweetest man. Did you ever see the the um, flash mob for his birthday? No, uh, I didn't see that. Yeah, it was really sweet. He was like at a restaurant on a balcony and like a hundred people showed up and all sang Maybe Chim Chim Cherry. No, they Possibly sang. Possibly Step in Time? Or Jolly. I think they actually did a medley. Okay. And it's like the sweetest, I'll link to it. It's like the sweetest thing ever. Okay. He's, a, he's great. I just, I just hope he lives forever. He will. Of course he will. He's what's, great. What's his age? He's a 90, he's a million. He's a god. Did you know that Dick Van Dyke is actually the. <laughs> I'm happy to hear it. He is a god come to earth. Great. He's uh, just a fantastic performer. Um, I think we should talk about Julie. Great. What was your impression of Julie Andrews? Because I can tell you what you said to me. What did I say to you? You said, oh, she's very pretty. Julie Andrews is one of the most beautiful women in the world. Okay. Yeah. She's gorgeous and talented. She's great. Yeah. She's so good. Mm -hmm. I. She lost her voice. You know, she can't sing anymore. I know. It's really sad yeah it but is it no it's not she's she, fine it's not sad she's fine she's fine she's still great she's the fucking best yeah um there's so much stuff i feel like i brought more to this movie about julie andrews than i did about mary poppins okay like in terms of my emotions okay i grew my up emotion. <laughs> i grew up in a broadway house yes you did uh my mom super like grew up in new york city super super into broadway i grew up listening to like your mom loves like the sound of music king and i like all the old rogers and hammerstein totally yeah and i grew up the the one musical that i grew up listening to more than anything was my fair lady yeah the original broadway cast which is not rogers and hammerstein but like the of the same oeuvre right but it's learner and low learner and low yeah um which it of course starred rex harrison uh, and Julie Andrews. Yes. The Ju- original, the Broadway, the Broadway cast. Right. Yeah. Julie Andrews is Eliza Doolittle for me mm-hmm. because she is the Eliza Doolittle I always grew up with. I saw the movie My Fair Lady. I've seen it a couple of times. Uh, it's good because it's My Fair Lady and Rex Harrison's in it. Yeah. But of course, Eliza Doolittle was famously played by Audrey Hepburn. Right. In my house, we were always salty about the fact that Julie Andrews didn't play Eliza in the movie. Right. But she did this instead. Right. Yeah. And I- won the Oscar for it. And okay. So uh, it's even better than that. Okay. Because Audrey Hepburn wasn't even nominated for an Oscar. Okay. They were both nominated for a Golden Globe, Uh which Julie Andrews won. Okay. So she got to beat Audrey Hepburn for the Golden Globe. And then she just won the Oscar. And Audrey Hepburn wasn't even nominated. Yeah. So it's even better than that. Great. The other thing I really liked, uh, so Marnie Nixon Uh is like famously the voice they bring in to sing when the actress can't sing. Who I constantly confused for marty noxon of buffy right. <laughs> a different person yes who's also a good singer yeah no i know i get them confused like i know the difference between them yeah. but i just get the names confused in my head they're very similar names yeah uh for those people who have seen once more with feeling the buffy musical episode marty noxon is the woman who gets a parking ticket so it's marnie nixon and marty noxon that's correct you can understand why that would be confusing except for the fact that they're separated by like 40 or 50 years i understand that i understand that okay please continue 
uh, Marnie Nixon is in the movie Mary Poppins. She's the voice of the Cockney geese. Okay. In the Jolly Holiday scene. Great. I didn't know she also played a nun in The Sound of Music, like with Julie Andrews. Oh, like like her actual physical body? Yes. In, yeah, voice and body. Oh, voice and body. Yes. That's uh, great. That's my understanding. Good for her, yeah. Um, I've always been salty that Julie Andrews wasn't in My Fair Lady because I think she's better at playing Eliza than Audrey Hepburn. Okay. Um, And this is not like, I don't have anything against Audrey Hepburn. I just, she was not the best person for the role of Eliza Doolittle in the movie. And Julie Andrews is amazing. But then but and then who else would have been Mary Poppins? She couldn't have done both. They would have waited. They did wait. Ah. They, they wanted to make Mary Poppins with her and she was pregnant. And they said, we'll wait as long. We'll wait. It's totally fine. And she said, well, I'm not sure. I just don't know if I can do it. And they said, no, it's totally fine. We want you. So let's wait. Okay. So my opinion. Yes. About Julie Andrews. Yes. Is, is, is this. Yeah. And then I would like to hear what you think about okay. it. Uh, this is one of the best performances I've ever seen in any movie. Yeah, I mean, why do you say that? I believe she made the character work. Uh huh. This is a character who is vain, uh, snippy. Mm -hmm. She gaslights constantly. Mm -hmm. There's all of these things we have to make us not like the character. Yeah, and yet. And yet we still love the character. Right. I didn't leave the book Mary Poppins loving the character. Mm -hmm. I left the book respecting the character. I understood what she was doing. Yeah. And I thought she was a good nanny. Yeah. But I didn't love her. Yeah. I love the Mary Poppins from the movie. Yeah. I mean, the way that you say that makes a lot of sense. Like, it seems effortless because it's like, oh, yeah, that's Mary Poppins. But like the thing that you're saying makes a lot of sense, which is that there's all of these sort of contrasting elements of the character that do blend together very seamlessly and seemingly very effortlessly. It makes us like the character. But yeah, you're right. Like she does a lot of things that like are not super appealing, but yet it's all folded into this very positive character. I completely agree. Yeah. And this this now is kind of the end of my argument yeah, that she's a god no 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 the end of my argument no i'm done with that i'm <laughs> done with that the end of my argument that mary poppins the movie is the definitive version of mary poppins yeah the book is delightful mm -hmm. and laid so much groundwork to inspire the movie but i feel like it took the people working on the movie to make a piece of art that came to life mm -hmm. in a way that the book doesn't yeah I just think so many people care in yeah. the movie. It's a really loving production. Yeah. Well, the scene in Saving Mr. Banks that I always remember is um, the scene where P.L. Travers kind of comes around because she's been very, she's been putting up roadblocks every which way. And she's been like, just, she doesn't want this to happen, but she like needs the money. Um, and at one point she says to Walt Disney, yeah, I mean, I just don't want red no red in the film and he's like i don't understand we can't are you are you saying we have to make a movie without the color red she's like yes i just prefer it like she's being i'm off red yeah she's just being super 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 shitty and she comes in one day and the guys that have been like trying to get her to come around say hey we've written this new song that sort of redeems mr banks at the end and they start playing let's go fly a kite and she's like tapping at her and she's just so delighted because she thinks they finally get it right like she's like he fixes the kite yes that's what I want he fixes the kite um and I feel like it brings them her around to kind of trust them a little bit more and like they're all singing and dancing and it's it's a little bit too easy like that she's won over that quickly but I just think the scene where they're all singing Let's Go Fly a Kite is so delightful because it's such a fun song and such a great song to end the movie. Um, that That's kind of what I think about when I think about like what went into making this movie was these was people who were really trying hard to do the right thing in the right place at the right time. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. I think they succeeded so well. Yeah. It's I didn't come out of this loving Mary Poppins, mm -hmm. the movie. But I think I came out of it with a respect for it that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Certainly as an adaptation, it's kind of monumental. Yeah. It really is. Can I just say, like, I completely forgot to mention this before, but in terms of being a high watermark of, like, Disney live action. Yeah. Do you know the other movies that Robert Stevenson directed? You had mentioned them to me at one time, but 
feel free to read them off. I got to read this list. This is crazy. And if if we're only comparing Mary Poppins to these other movies, it's the high water mark. But there's so many other ones that are not in this list. Robert Stevenson directed Johnny Tremaine, Old Yeller, Darby O'Gill and the Little People, Kidnapped, The Absent-Minded Professor, Son of Flubber, The Misadventures of Merlin Jones, The Monkey's Uncle, That Darn Cat, The Gnome Mobile, Blackbeard's Ghost, The Love Bug, Herbie Rides Again, The Shaggy DA, and Bedknobs and Broomsticks. So, a Disney treasure. Like, this guy, I think he's... Like he's, I think he's kind of a hack. Yeah. In, in, in the real definition of it. Like yeah. he shows up and he does a job. Yeah. But he's fucking good at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, just like, I mean, I don't find much problematic about this movie that was written and produced in 1964. Like this is literally the one note I wrote. I didn't write a lot of notes because I know Mary Poppins and I felt comfortable talking about it. But this is literally the one thing I wrote down. Bullet point. Critique of toxic masculinity. <laughs> Which was in regards to... Mr. Banks. Yeah. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. like stoic. I, I wrote stoic masculinity. It's like the the thing that the things that he's saying about being a man and not showing emotions and like providing and what it's like when they're at the bank, like what it's like to be a man. The movie breaks down. It's It says, no, this is not right. What, what you need to do to be a man, much like the Godfather, I guess, is spend time <laughs> with your family. <laughs> A man is not a real man unless he spends time with his family. Um, all you have to do is go fly a kite. Yeah. Is it problematic when Admiral Boom thinks that all of the chimney sweeps? D- I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Let's just move on. Okay. No, I want to talk about it. So this is something that never occurred to me when I was a kid. But like in the scene at the end of Step in Time, all of the chimney sweeps whose faces are dark, dirty are dirty and dark from a distance they're on a rooftop across the way from admiral boom and he thinks they're being attacked by like what hot and tots is that what he says something like that there's a racial aspect to this that never occurred to me when i was but a admiral kid but admiral boom is very old and maybe racist but i don't know that the movie endorses his point of view no but the movie is saying at worst it's funny <laughs> But that's honestly, that's all I've got. Yeah. Those were all my notes. I enjoyed it. I really, really did. Just at the end of the day, like I've been thinking about this, right? Like if you ask me like, what are your top five favorite movies? I don't think I would like light on Mary Poppins. Oh, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. Like that's one of my favorite movies. But like as I was watching this, just like every scene more delightful than the next. Like, but it just brought back a lot of memories of like being a child and watching this movie and how magical it felt I remember my dad singing I love to laugh with me like in the bathtub like and I couldn't have been more than five you know what I mean like I just this is definitely a a Lipshaw family favorite and it's one of those movies that you can go back and watch again and again and it doesn't make you feel bad for liking it because the love and care that went into it is is like really really apparent and it's I feel like it's a great movie and if you haven't seen it in a long time I definitely recommend it I agree with that yeah and Mary Poppins is a god want to do some quadrants yeah let's do some quadrants let's do it all right this is I I'm interested to hear what you think because I've been thinking about this okay do you think that the people who made this movie care deeply about the source material yes yeah. They literally made a movie about how much the people who made this movie cared about the source material. They mm-hmm. made a whole movie about it. We watched it. Like, I do think that Saving Mr. Banks is kind of Disney propaganda. I know that you think that. No, no, no. But, <laughs> no, hang on. Let me finish. God damn it. I do think that part of it was a little dishonest. Uh-huh. And the part of it that I think is a little dishonest is the part that says all of their decisions were the right decisions and P.L. Travers was standing in the way of something great. Yes, that's the part that I think that's, is propaganda. That's fine. But the part that I absolutely buy is how much they wanted to do a good job. Yes. And how much Disney cared about the source material. Because he, the part that is not in dispute is the fact that he tried for 20 years to make it. Because yeah. he made a promise to his daughters that he would. The story that he tells about he went into his daughters and they were reading a book and laughing together. And he said, what are you reading? And they said, Daddy, it's Mary Poppins. Like that, that story like had me in tears. Like I'm a little bit choked up now just thinking about it. 
like I that was very true like it felt very honest and it felt like when he kept saying like the reason I'm not going to give up is because I made a promise to my daughters to make this movie and they're adults now and I don't care you keep you keep a promise Mm -hmm. that's what you do yep so as a movie, yes. is it ultimately successful? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Like, like I would even go so far as to say it's like a high water mark of adaptation. Yeah. And if we were to kind of break it down and say like, uh, let's say children's movies that are adapted from books, mm-hmm. like one of the best ever made. Sure. It's yeah. so good. It's great. So, Mo- so good. Movie musicals, one of the best. Yeah. By far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dick Van Dyke movies. Julie Dude. Andrews movies. Like, sure. So many things. They're in love. Yes. They are in love. I, Bert and Mary I'm are in love. I'm fine with that interpretation. They're I'm a... f- finer with that than she's a god. Adorable. Both are true. Great. And that's why he knows he can never have her because she's a god. Oh, boy. This has been Adapter Parish. If you'd like to find us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AdaptCast. And if you tweet about the show, don't forget to use the AdaptCast hashtag. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to adapterparishcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, there are two great ways you can do it. First, tell a friend. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice would be greatly appreciated. Let's go fly a kite. That's that's what you've got. (laughs) Spit spot. That's the end. Bye. Bye.